Hey there, Crystal Covington here, and we are having an amazing discussion today on the topic of the Denver real estate market. And we're hearing from some real estate experts to talk to us about both investor real estate and just general market information that we can all use to understand what's going on today and if it's a good time or a bad time to buy for our personal goals. I have worked with uh, Diane and Melody with the Rivera team of Keller Williams and I uh, really enjoyed the experience of getting my first investment home, which is about to be rented out this spring. So we in all Great. the things that I will wow. have to do in the process, all the lease, all the, the lease information, spiffing it up and making decisions and all those things. And so this conversation for me is a precious moment in being able to get a little bit more information to understand what things look like and bring that information to others that want to follow in the same footsteps and do certain things. It was always a goal of mine. So I'm excited to have Diane and Melody here and you all can take it away with sharing your presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Crystal. We're glad to be here. So I'm Melody Rivera with Keller Williams Realty Urban Elite and I started buying real estate about 30 years ago. So it's probably been 35 years ago, I got my first investment. I purchased a home in Chicago and then rented out the bedrooms. And from that day forward, I have purchased multiple units, six units, four units, three units, condos. I purchased in Chicago and then now my market is Denver. And so I've had a lot of experience in the different um, types of renting and leasing and buying that sort of thing. So. Thank you for having us. Um, I've been in the real estate business 25 years. I've owned rental properties in the past, hoping to build that portfolio back up again. Actually, my first one was Melody's property that I bought. She was doing a 1031 exchange. I wish I would have kept that. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we all say, even in this business. So we're excited to be here today and share with you information about investment properties and how we can make that attainable for you guys and grow your wealth. Yeah. So I think where we want to go first is just really what makes a, a good real estate property um, and a, a good investment. And, I, and why do you want to invest in real estate and what's our market doing here in Denver? So Denver is quite aggressive. There are properties out here that you can buy, um, whether it's a condo, whether it's a single family, um, whether it's a multi-unit. But to get started, um, with properties, sometimes a lot of people will do condos, but what makes a good, why is real estate a good um, item to best invest in? You do, you do have something that is tangible. You have a property that will create uh, money for you. It'll create passive income, income for you. It grows in value over time and somebody else pays your mortgage down. So I think that really is what's been so beneficial for me over 30 years. Um, currently, my husband and I have about 37 units um, that we deal with. So maybe about 15 buildings. And we have them all from a single family to a condo to multi-units. What else can you think of? I think you touch on most of them. It's tangible. So it's brick and mortar, provide shelter. It's deductible, depreciable, deferrable. And you can use it as leverage once your equity grows, move that money into another property. Oh. Um, probably another question you probably have on your mind is, should I invest, it, invest in real estate at this time? Are we at the top of the market? So I invest in all markets, it, whether it's a down market, whether we're in a recession, we're transitioning, whether we're seeing equity build. Because really what I find is right now is what is in our favor is the interest rates. So when I first got into the market, I purchased property at 14%. Then it went to 9%. Then it went to 7%. And yes, the prices were a little lower then. So don't focus on the ticket price. You really want to focus on what your money can buy you right now, your return on your investment. And money is very inexpensive. So right now, um, Mike and I are looking at another piece of property. We'll lock in at about three and a half percent right now. And that is really reasonable um, to be buying money at or borrowing money 
for investment properties. It's not seven, it's not nine. It helps you leverage that money when it's inexpensive. Um, and you can buy small things like, like small condos um, and small little homes are out here between 350 and 450. And our rents, the other reason that it's a good time to buy now with investment is because our rental market is doing really well. And our rents, um, Diane and I did a little bit of history on the rents and they've slowly increased about 3% a year, but they're anticipating over the next five to 10 years that Denver will have a slow or a aggressive incline in rents just because we have a lot of people moving here. Mm -hmm. And that has a little bit to do with the pandemic. People don't want to be in such a dense market anymore. They want to spread out. So our rental market's doing really well. So you have two things working for you, low interest rates, plus an um, increase in rents. What else? I agree. Think I think, you know, we get the question a lot, is it the time to buy in such a challenging market? But no matter what market it is, it's always challenging. It's just the reverse side of the coin. So whether it's a buyer's market or seller's market, right now it's a seller's market. We have low inventory, challenging, but we have historic low rates. But on the other side, you know, we could have more inventory, but the interest rates are higher. So you kind of pick your poison. I think you just need to make the decision and then execute it. But when we get questions like that, every, every market's challenging. You just need to pick your tolerance and make a decision to execute your plan. Yeah. And I think where probably where our experience comes in is just that Diane and I have worked all markets. It's mm -hmm. the combined in experience we're 50 years plus. <laughs> so we have worked every type of market that you can think of. We can make the numbers work. We just have to find the right product, whether that's a condo, a multi-unit, a single family, maybe it's just a half duplex. So yeah. Um, I think the other Probably the third question that we need to um, look at is really what resources do you need? Who do you need on your team when you start this investment process? And you certainly need a CPA or an accountant, a bookkeeper to start keeping track of the different rental properties that you invest in. Mm -hmm. You may need an attorney. Um, a lot of my properties are in an LLC and you don't have to do that right away. However, most investors do go that direction. It gives them protection. It gives them a little bit more leverage on um, what they can use for write-offs and how the taxes get done. I know enough about that to be dangerous. So that's why we have a CPA. You also probably need a handyman uh, in, your, in your back pocket just so that they can help you. People like plumbers, electricians. And Diane and I have a lot of those resources because we're in selling real estate, but um, I also buy a lot of real estate. So we do have those, so we can help with those. What else do you think we need? Um, it's a lot of pieces, but I think most importantly, you need a good team. You need your lender, you need your realtors, you need your CPAs, you need your attorneys to help you with leases. So as long as you have a good, experienced, strong team behind you, you'll be successful. Yeah, and uh, that probably... Um, a lot of people sometimes find those people on their own, but we have lots of real estate attorneys we can refer you to. We have several CPAs we can refer you to, several account, uh, even bookkeepers, um, people who need to help you with plumbing, electrical, that sort of thing. So I think, I think another big question for people is how long does it take to be successful? And, you know, I've, I've had properties probably up to 50 or 55 properties. And did we have to readjust and realign when we were um, buying all these properties? Yes, we did because the markets shift and they change. So we had to readjust during 2008 and, and get rid of half of those properties. And then as we came out of 2008, we started working on our portfolio again. So I'm, I, in my opinion, I think if you have your home and one other investment, that certainly makes you successful mm -hmm. um, because people, real estate can really be leveraged and it really helps you create wealth for yourself over time, but it also helps pay things. Um, for instance, I have a cousin who's put her daughter through college and she has five condos. That's, that's really what she's had. And she's had those for 15 years and that's what she purchases. So I think any amount of real estate in your portfolio um, can create success for you. 
I think, in my opinion, well, we know it's a long game. So equity goes up and someone else is paying down the debt. I think that's the huge benefit of investment properties. And, you know, success is different for everyone. For some, it pays, like, for example, your cousin, I know we have, we've had this conversation many times, it pays all her expenses. So it's a lifestyle for her. So I think money's the scorecard and it just depends where your goals and your plans fit in. Yeah. So I, I truly believe success is in, um, the, in, in the person who's investing, mm -hmm. you know, if I know people have 500 units, you know, and I think it's, where's your goal? Where are you trying to get to? Do you, do you want to have everything covered for yourself? Do you want to have income at retirement? So it's another conversation we can have. Um, those are numbers that certainly for me, I based my numbers on how many units do I need to get to a lifestyle where Mike and I don't have to work. It can carry all of our expenses and we can do some traveling. I mean, we, we travel maybe every few months, but that's probably one of our goals is that we can keep doing that and not have to bring in, not have to actually work um, a job. So yeah, so. Next question we get often is how much money do I need to save up to get my first property? That's usually people's actual first question. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. So typically a minimum of three and a half percent down up to 20%. It's gonna depend on financing and what your goals are and what you have available. Mm -hmm. And I think Diane brings up a good point because where I started was with $500 on a HUD home in Chicago. That's all I had to put down and the seller paid my closing costs. So I went into the property with $500. I just helped another client on her first home and she used Chaffa mm -hmm. and she is going to eventually rent that home out. But she came to the closing table with $1,000 the seller did pay for her closing costs and it was 1000 because Chaffa's Colorado housing department, they have money available through the government that they have every single year to help you with your down payment. And I think that's a great starting point for everyone. If you don't own investment properties right now, because it's your residence, you need somewhere to live. You can rent out the bedrooms if you, if you need to and bedrooms right now, now rent between 800 and 1400, mm -hmm. um, depending on where you're located in the city. So that helps with expenses, but it's, if you can get Chaffa, it's about a thousand dollars. If um, to own your first time home, it's about three and a half percent entry point. And then you can take that house, rent it and move to your next property and do it again. Mm -hmm. I probably did that three times. I went from the house, to a two flat that they call in Chicago. So I only had to put down three and a half percent. My tenant paid for the bottom, which paid for the most of my mortgage. Then I took those two properties and I moved them to Colorado and I bought two, a duplex. I lived in one half and then I did it one more time, purchased another duplex and lived in one half because that allowed me to just put the minimum down and, and put the rest of the money away. So just in case I needed anything, um, just for maintenance and that sort of thing. And I had a little bit of a cushion. So yeah. Mm. So. A lot of different ways to get in, especially if it's your first time doing it, um, definitely on the minimum. Once you build a quite a large portfolio, like the Mike and Mel's of the world, so you're probably looking more towards a bigger down payment. Yes. Anywhere so we around do 20%. 20%, anywhere between 20 mm -hmm. to um, 30%. And the reason that 30% comes into place, sometimes we're looking at commercial property and mm -hmm. anything or units and above is considered commercial. So we typically have to put 30 to 35% down. So yeah, a lot of different ways to get creative, a lot of different scenarios. And we actually have another class that we'll chat about at the end about using your retirement accounts to actually convert that into money down for investment properties. Yeah. So, okay. Awesome. Thanks for sharing those details that you kind of went point by point by point on the questions that I provided. I wanted to throw in another question that I thought of as you were talking. And, you know, so I, I'm, I've been looking at things because my mother-in-law is trying to um, purchase and seeing the market. I wonder, you know, when, and we're talking primarily in this meeting about investment properties, but even for people that are looking for their first home, 
where is the bottom right now for opportunities that, you know, is it, when people want to get in at a lower price because it's more comfortable for them? Where do people need to be looking? What areas have the lower rates? Because I know Denver is insane right now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So we may have different opinions about this, right? <laughs> and, you know, so if we were looking at an entry level property for, you know, your first time buyer, we typically, I was just in Aurora, there's still some condos there that are the 250s, the 270s. Mm -hmm. um, but a year ago, those properties were 199, 200 and 235. So we, we really just need people to step in and go because the market is outpacing all of us very quickly. Um, so where else would you suggest? You know, if you're looking, you know, your Arvadas are still for single family. There's still some great pricing over there that you can get into. You know, our challenge is supply and demand and it's pushing the prices up. But I saw that great um, Applewood townhome for 350, which is yeah. a great location come up yesterday. So I think there's a lot of opportunities. Um, Barnum and Westwoods is starting to push up, but you can still get in there under 500, 400 for a property there. Those would probably be my top yeah. recommendations. And some people, so if people are here in Denver and they want bigger land and bigger lots, mm -hmm. you certainly, I was just in Watkins, believe it or <laughs> not, which is a good 50 minutes from here. And Watkins will get you five acres, it gets you 6,000 square foot house for 700. And here in the city, we, we, we get a half duplex maybe or a small tiny bungalow for 700. So certainly the outskirts do, do create more opportunity for people at a lower price. Mm -hmm. um, but your first time buyers, I would say we, we have to go to Aurora. That's really where we still have some entry point. I agree. The 200s to 300. And so. to answer your question, Crystal, on where's the bottom? You know, I wish we had all had a crystal ball. But, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I had buyers four years ago and they were like, I'm going to wait till the market goes down. And even a year ago, and now it's even hard for them to get in. I mean, some of them still can because we're very fortunate the rates are so low. But once those rates start ticking up, and they did a little bit last week, I mean, they start losing buying power. And I don't think people sometimes realize big picture. Now's your entry point for yeah. as cheap as money is. Get in. Don't look at the ticket price. Yeah. <laughs> That's just going to keep going up, I yeah. think. Well, it'll, I mean, I think we'll see it level. I don't think we can continually be on this uptick for, you know, another five years by any means. But it, the market is still very strong. Yeah, one of our... Um, someone I follow that is in the mortgage industry, she actually did some calculations and shared a video that talked about the difference between coming in. So she's saying if next summer the prices are higher uh, or, or for example, she said, um, I'm getting it wrong. She was saying that people were waiting to see if the prices go down. And so she did calculations that said, so if the home price went down, but the rates were higher, you actually have a higher mortgage than you would if you bought that property at a higher price today. And it blew my mind because I couldn't understand those numbers until I wouldn't have even considered that until she said so. So the, the, the mortgage rates themselves can impact your mortgage, monthly mortgage costs. So it's actually not always advantageous to wait because you just don't know what those, what those rates will be in because they're so, um, so much lower right now. Yeah, they, you know, we kind of use this calculation for every percent we go up, <clears throat> it'll affect your buying power, 75 to 80,000. It's a huge amount. And then in addition, not only do you have to lower your price, but then you have a mortgage amount that also goes up in cost, right? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Jamie asked a question, what are your thoughts on what's going to happen with evictions and problems with forbearances due to job losses in the pandemic? Well, we've been tracking that. So right now they're saying that um, over three and a half million people are in the forbearance period, but most of them are starting to come out now and they are actually catching up their mortgage. So we, we would literally have to have three and a half million people get um, 
their home taken away. They would have to go into foreclosure today for all of that inventory to go on the market and for us to see um, a downturn. And, and the reality of it is that's not gonna happen. You're not gonna have three, three and a half million go into forbearance and many of those are starting to come back out. So we see that we're watching it because just as realtors out here, we need to see are the foreclosures coming? Are, are they pretty steady? What's happening, especially in Colorado? In Colorado, we have hard, we just don't have any. It's, right. it's really hard to find foreclosures. They're here, but um, not nearly at the amount that we had in the 90s. And then the evictions, evictions. So we, I think that people, investors are in the business there. It's a business for them. So as soon as the moratorium comes off, yes, those people will probably get evicted, but they don't need to be because Mike and I have found a lot of resources for our tenants and we've been able to get their rents paid. And I think what happens sometimes these big, big investors with many, many buildings, they're just hiring an attorney and they're getting them evicted where really there is a lot of resources out there for them to get their rents paid. So that's the avenue Mike and I took. And you know now all of our people are back on um, schedule, but we did have to um, help them figure out where are those resources and how do we keep them in the property? So, mm -hmm. yeah. And it, yeah, and it worked out fine. It's there, the resources are there. Yeah, I had a really great conversation recently. I have a, um, a marketing client that is in the, in, in the real estate wholesaling business and he is a tech founder, created a technology for that and all that. So I was talking to him about some of the topics of things that are going on. And he said he's seen all these uh, bad news stories about um, in investor owners and things like that. And he feels like there's negative um, connotations to being an investor owner. And I kind of dove into that a little bit to understand what, what have you seen and what's, you know, what is inaccurate about that. And one of the things that he kind of said is there are um, bad reputations created by those people who are, um, you know, people give them that name slumlord, but people that don't see their properties, don't ride past them, don't know what's going on, don't check in on their residents and things like that. But he feels, at least in his experience, that that is a rare thing and that for most people, they care about these properties because they want to keep them. They you know, want to keep nice what they've purchased and they care about the people that rent with them. And the relationship is actually mutually beneficial. And I just want to say that just because there are people that have, maybe they have the capacity to be an investor owner, but they feel like, oh, that's sleazy. It feels like a negative thing because they've seen those bad stories. But if you are a great owner, you actually create the capacity for somebody to have a nice place that is well maintained without having to put up the upfront cash. This was a realization for me this year as we did this and then realized there are people, I mean, it took a lot of cash for us to buy a you know, a $300,000 house. So I realized it was like, how do people do this? I, I recognize there are opportunities when you are a, a direct home buyer, there are, you don't need as much cash up, cash up front. But even in the beginning, when we first bought, we had a, um, an FHA loan, I think, and it was a lot cheaper. It was still, it was like $11,000. And that was a big chunk of what we had saved over 10 years. Sure. So it's it's harder for people to buy than to rent in some cases, and so I, I realize that there it is a, a nice um, it provides opportunities for people. And if you're a great investor and take care of your properties, you keep you actually are supporting and promoting beautification of neighborhoods and helping to you know bring investment to an area. Sometimes owners um, can't make uh, capital improvements on a house, but when an investor purchases it, they improve that home, which improves the neighborhood, and then it makes it a better home for the next person who owns it. It's so true. We, you know, Mike takes a lot of pride in the properties that we have. He probably visits 
them every other day. And if something's wrong, he's maintaining it. And so, um, and there are, you know, a lot of people in our tribe of investors, they're very similar in, in the way that they, they maintain these properties. But you bring up a good point. Crystal, a lot of things that maybe got run down over time because people just couldn't manage them. They get elderly, right? They yeah. can't do the maintenance. And you get an investor that comes in and fixes a lot of that up, which we've done with a few of ours. It really does improve the neighborhood. So, you know, you've got that handful out there that just don't do what they need to do. And most of the time, not all the time, but a lot of times what I find is the pattern is that they're out of state and yeah. then just on keeping tabs on it you know so yeah so awesome well i'm going to end the recording thanks so much for your time and sharing this and anybody that's interested in learning more about melody and diane please follow the links and uh let us know how we can support you